Brethren, John the Baptist <clears throat> pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now we know that Jesus came to save the lost, and the lost includes everyone, amen? Even though everyone is not going to receive salvation, we understand that. But it is God's will that everyone should be saved. It's not his will that any should perish. You know, Peter said, it's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and receive salvation. But placing that aside, let us consider our calling. That we are not just among those in the world that have been set apart for salvation, but we are the chosen bride of Jesus Christ. We are the first fruits. Our names are written from the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life. He knew us before we were born. He chose us to be a part of his administration, the very body of Jesus. How glorious is that? That Jesus is walking in you and I today. That he is living his life. That he is letting his light shine in us today in this dark world. That others may see. Some will come. Most will not come. And it will be a witness against them. But let us consider our calling. Let us consider that. Think about history. How many people in history are a part of the first fruits. Very few. I mean, the scattered names that we see recorded in, in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, we see that trusted in Christ, before they knew Christ as, before Christ came in the flesh and gave his life as the Lamb of God. But they trusted. They looked ahead. They believed in the promise. They believed that God would provide and even now, there's so few of us. <clears throat> you, you know, we don't know who it is that's truly yielded to God and allowing God's Holy Spirit to fill them who've received the Holy Spirit. We don't know how many out here among people who claim to be Christians. But I would say it's very few, wouldn't you? Very few that actually have ever come to real repentance and have actually ever truly died to themselves and receive baptism. And then as David said, he didn't call it sanctification, but that's what it is. The part of being saved, it's a sanctif sanctifying process. We are saved. We're in the process of being saved through sanctification. That's what I want to talk about today is our sanctification in Christ Jesus. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We sh that should be so we should see the value. It, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be saved. It's a wonderful thing to be an invited guest. It's a wonderful thing to even know that God would give his own son to save you. But as we see in Romans chapter 9, it is God's prerogative. It's his choice. His choice will stand. And Paul says, you... you you, old man, cannot argue with God. If he chooses to make some vessels in his house as vessels for common use and some vessels for, for, to receive glory, that's his prerogative. And we were created, the first fruits, it says, to his glory. And to receive and to walk in his glory, to, to have his glory abiding in us. We are a holy temple the bride of Christ, the first fruits, the very body, the members of the body of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And that's precious. That's worth more than everything. Everything. So let's remember who we are. When we think about what God, God has called us to, the things in the world don't seem so hard. They don't seem so difficult, you see, when we're looking at what God has called us and saved us to or for, for the purpose for. <clears throat> as I grow older, this world is not as appealing at all. The things of the world are not appealing at all like they used to be. I see how corrupt it is. Every, everything 
is corrupted. You know, the whole earth is corrupted. All of us people are corrupted. Now, we've been washed. We're being sanctified. We have been given new life. But as Paul said in Romans chapter 7, we still have the body of death that is present with us at all times. And that's a corrupted body. Even though we don't own it. And it doesn't own us. Amen. Sanctification. Hallelujah. You know, I've often used the words to sanctify means to set apart, and it does. God set apart the Sabbath, the, the seventh day. He set it apart. But when you say set apart, it's set apart for something. Set apart for a purpose. Now, I want to give you the actual definition of the meaning of sanctification from the dictionary what it means to you and me. Sanctification is the state of properly functioning. You see, the, we are saved. We're saved from our sins, but then we receive the death of ourself. Amen? Adam dies in Christ, and we're risen as a new creation in Christ. And in that new creation, we receive the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, not grieved nor quenched in us, will produce a state in us where we are properly functioning. We're working and functioning at uh, where God, how God, how Christ and the Father wants us to to function. Now, if we put it in a little bit more religious sounding way, we could say it's walking in and fulfilling your purpose. Walking in it. Walking in Christ. That is allowing the Holy Spirit to, to walk in us and live Christ's life in, in us. And brethren, brethren, as you know, Aubrey's saying, I'm going to let this little light of mine shine. <clears throat> it's not so little. It is the light of the world. It is the light of all men. It is a light that shines forth in the darkness. It's a very powerful light. And Christ has planted his Holy Spirit and his sanctifying work of the Spirit and himself through the agency of the Holy Spirit in us in order that we would let our light shine. And the only Jesus that people in the world are going to see is the Jesus they see in you and me. And that's okay because that's what we're called That's what we're called to be. And we are what he is. All we have to do is make sure we don't put a bushel over it or we don't allow something to hamper it or to quench it. Nothing witnesses to anyone like a saint of God walking in the sanctification by which the Holy Spirit is bearing the fruits that we see in Galatians chapter 5. The fruits of love, of joy, of gentleness, of goodness, of kindness, of, uh, of self-control, of patience, long-suffering. That's con- world, amen? See, the world does not see peace. The world has never seen peace since the first sin. There has not been peace. Peace has been taken from the world, even from the animal, insect kingdom, all living things. Peace has been taken. In the world, people do not see peace. In the world, they don't have peace. They don't even know it's possible to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace not of your own making and not of circumstances, but a peace that comes from the sanctifying work of the Spirit in us. So when we allow that uh, God's fruit to be born in us, fruit such as peace, when you're sick or in normally troubled times, but you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you fear no evil and you're comforted there by knowing that God is with you and knowing that there is nothing that you're going to go through that is not going to turn out for your good if you put God first. Amen? That's wonderful. People don't really know love, but they think they know love, but they really don't know peace. They have no idea about peace. And people think they know joy, but they don't know joy. They know how to be happy over something, but they don't know how to have an abiding joy. 
You know, Peter says that the Spirit gives us some versions that says unspeakable joy or inexpressible joy, as it says in the New American Standard. It's a joy that you can't even express. You can't even tell someone the joy that you have. And the joy is in the Lord, and the joy is in, in receiving and valuing the purpose that God has for us. Amen. I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And how glorious is it to represent Jesus? Jesus went away. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he said, if I go away, it's to your advantage, because that which is among you shall be in you. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is designed to just produce thousands of Jesuses, where people just see Jesus in us. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, notice verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, <clears throat> nor those who covet, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice verse 11. Such were some of you. But you were washed. That's the initial saving what David was talking about. But you were washed, but you were sanctified. You see, receiving salvation, we receive salvation when we repent of our sins and we accept Christ as our personal Savior. But we are sanctified when we allow Christ's life to live in us. And we allow the, His fruits to be manifested in us. Such were some of you, but you were washed, <clears throat> but you were sanctified, but you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the, and in the spirit of our God. Verse 14. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but he will also raise us up through his power. Verse 17. <clears throat> but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. You see, we are one with him through the Spirit. Amen? So flee immorality and every other sin that a man commits. Every other sin a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. There's so many people that are deceived. As David was saying, Satan will always offer freedom or bondage in the name of freedom. Let's put it that way. He'll say, you'll be free. People think that <laughs> you know, recently someone that has left suggested a book on sexual freedom to one of our members. And somehow that's supposed to be, make someone free. It brings people into bondage is what it does. It sets yourself up as the rule, ruler of your life and yourself up as what is good and what is not good. But you see, we find that immorality is a sin against the body. All other sins are outside the body. Immorality is a, is a particularly grievous sin. It's against the body, and the body is designed to be the temple of God. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Once we come to Christ, we don't belong to ourselves. We were purchased. We can't say to God, well, I want to continue to do what I want to do. I want to pursue my own interests. Oh, you know. You really don't. You don't. Not in your right mind. You really don't. You want to pursue the things that are eternal, that will never fade away. You don't want the things that are corrupted. You want the things that are eternal. So he says, do you not know that your, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. He's talking to the church. He, he says, look, you're a temple. You don't belong to yourself. For you have been bought with a price. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body. Don't use your body for your own pleasures. Use your body to bring glory and pleasure to God. Amen? And then we will truly be fulfilled. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> Don't ever be joy, joy and peace except in yielding to the Spirit. Amen? And the Spirit is in us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, notice verse 13. But we should all, always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. That's through the sanctifying process. In other words, if you abide in Christ, see, if the Holy Spirit is taken, well, once the Holy Spirit is taken, it's over. And that's a very sad thing. And <clears throat> that's what it's saying in here, speaking earlier about the warning about the Antichrist and how he'll come with all deception to deceive people. Because we have to love the truth above all else. And sometimes the truth is not easy to accept. Sometimes it's not what we initially uh, want, but we have to always trust God. You know, maybe Eve didn't want to hear what she heard. Maybe uh, we do know the fruit was attractive to her, desirable, once she began to look at it. But she shouldn't, you shouldn't ever begin to look at something that is unlawful to begin with. Amen? Don't start looking at something that's unlawful. Don't start doing something in an unlawful way. Because if you do, then you won't be thinking right. You'll be thinking like she did, as David said. But here it says, we should always give thanks to you, verse 13. <clears throat> thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was, it was for this he called you through the gospel. So our salvation is going to come through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. That's how we live our life and we allow Christ to live his life in us. That you may gain the glory. Notice, it, it, it was for this, verse 14, that he called you. For what? For salvation through sanctification. That the Spirit would rule in your body and that you would have faith in the truth. It was for this that he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to pursue, the glory of Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the, to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God of our Father, who <clears throat> has loved us, and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. You know, it's always easy to read over these things when we're talking about uh, a particular subject. But notice verse 16 again. Paul says, <clears throat> Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, both, who has loved us and has and given us eternal comfort. Now, that's there in Christ. Now, it's not there in the flesh. It's not there in the world, but it is there in Christ. Amen? He has given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts and every good work and word. Now, let's go over to Romans chapter 6. This is the chapter, you know, where uh, we read where, you know, we were crucified with Christ. Our old self was crucified with him and <clears throat> that the old body of sin might be done away. We're not going to read that part. We're going to uh, pick up later on. But that's what, that's the context. And so verse 12, notice. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So it's a choice, isn't it? We don't have to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. There are people that 
I, I know we've heard people say, well, I just can't. I've had people come to me and say, I just can't. No, you, you can't in the flesh, but you can in Christ. You're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You're more than able in Christ Jesus. And most of the time, it's not I can't. It's I don't want to or I won't. That's usually what it really comes down to. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. There's godly desires and there's lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Again, he's talking to us, the church. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. In other words, do what is right. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Well, may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, now understand, as we've talked before here, chapter 5 up to about, about verse 12 or so, it speaks of having our sins washed away, our sins dealt with. But after that, it's talking about having sin itself, the sin factory, who we are in the flesh, who we are in Adam. And that's why he went on before this earlier in the chapter and said, this is how God dealt with Adam. He killed Adam. <laughs> he killed Adam in you. You were crucified with Christ and you've been risen with Christ. So when it says, verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, that means slaves to Adam, your sin nature, your own nature. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin, that means being freed from the body of death, being freed from Adam, being freed from the one who produces sin, that is his nature to produce sin. You see, now we have a divine nature. You can yield to the nature of Adam or you can yield to the nature of the second Adam, the divine nature. But unless you're born again, you cannot yield to the divine nature because you don't possess the divine nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we, brethren, do. We have the Holy Spirit and therefore it is much more powerful now, we can receive the lie that we're not able. But that's, that is a lie. We're more than able through Christ who strengthens us. And having been freed from sin, we became slaves of righteousness. And that's like just saying, now that God has crucified Adam in us, the Adam that is in us, and we've been risen with Christ, we are now committed to and slaves of righteousness because we are now bound to and doing the will and serving the will of the Son of God as he lives his life in us by the power of the Spirit. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, which resulted in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. That will, and think about sanctification, the proper functioning, a state of proper functioning, walking and living the life of Christ, producing, bearing the fruits of Jesus. You see, that's what that means. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit, verse 21, were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, 
resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll see here in Peter that we are partakers of the divine nature. Now let that sink in. Once you receive the Holy Spirit, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and you have become partakers of a divine nature. You're a holy temple, and you do have a divine nature. Now, as we see in Romans chapter 7, the body of death will war, and the flesh will war against the spirit. But we need not be concerned because the spirit is stronger, much more powerful. And what we're warring against is actually dead. And we have to treat it that way. It doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. We will make mistakes. But sin cannot rule. Adam cannot rule. The flesh cannot rule. The world, the, you know, the things of the world, the desires of the world cannot rule us. It doesn't mean they won't, Satan won't knock on the door once in a while and give you thoughts. He will. But as Paul said, you capture every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. You see. Now notice verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So there is a true faith. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, his divine power has granted us everything we need. Amen? Amen. Through the true knowledge of him who called us, by his own glory and excellence. So we have, we see that his divine power has granted us everything that pertains to his, to, pertains to life and godliness. Verse four, for by these he granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. You know, John said it does not appear to us what we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be as he is. Now, we have, we may become partakers of the divine nature, and that nature is living in us now, and it will be revealed at the return of Christ. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, that's all the world has to offer. That's it. Just corruption and lust, things that are temporary, that, that are fool's gold, that seems to satisfy, but they never do. Anyone that's ever pursued things in the world, you know that once you get it, you think, is this all there is? People who have pursued riches, once they got them, they think, is this all there is? They're totally, they thought. They thought that they'd be fulfilled. They thought they would feel different. They would th- thought that they would have a sense of accomplishment, you know, but they don't because it's all fool's gold. Now for this very reason, verse five, what reason? Well, because we want to become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse five, now for this reason, also applying all diligence. Now it's saying, you know, we have a part to do. We have to be diligent. I mean, it's not just gonna, you know, you can't go sit in your car. It's not gonna go anywhere until you turn the key. And that's not gonna work unless you got gas in it and the battery's up and other things are working in it. You see, so this reason, apply all diligence in your faith 
and supply moral excellence, be beyond reproach morally. And in your moral excellence, add knowledge, true knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness toward your brothers and sisters. And in your brotherly kindness, love. I mean, think about it. That's what Jesus said. He said, all people will know you are my disciples for your love for one another. I remember one time I, I, when I had a shop on Main Street, there was a cafe just uh, a, a couple doors down, and we would go in there and have lunch. Sometimes we'd have a coffee break in the afternoon, and some of the other businessmen would be in there, and we'd sit and we'd visit. And I remember one businessman uh, told me that he noticed the, the closeness that the people in our church have with one another, how they truly love one another. Now, he was raised in a church. His whole family are preachers and singers. And he was raised you know, generations in, in Pentecostal churches. But he said he'd never seen that, and it was noticeable. It's palatable. You know, a genuine, real love. And that doesn't, that, see, that's not worldly. That comes from God. Only God can do that. That's really the love of God in us. And so you, you're going to know it's me, is what he's saying. You, you're going to know my followers. You're going to know who I'm walking in by their love for one another, by the fruits they bear. So add all these things, and he says, now, in your godliness, add brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, that's the sanctification process working, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be fruitful and we must be useful. Amen. He didn't plant us not to bear fruit. Amen. And he didn't plant us to bear bad fruit or worldly fruit, you know, or but the true fruit. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted. Short-sighted means you only think of what's temporary. You're only thinking about what you want right now. What will satisfy the need of the moment, you see? Or what you think will satisfy the need of the moment. For, verse 9, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. But we do have to practice these things. And he begins by saying, applying all diligence. You know, we have the example of the, of the Apostle Paul saying, he buffets his body. He brings his body under submission. Now, that's not willpower. That's just being committed to the power source. That's, that's making sure the power source is plugged in and there's not some fuse blown between you, <laughs> between it. You're making sure that the power is there. Christ in us will do what Christ does if we just make sure that we don't hamper Christ. That's all. We, need, we never need to think about what we need to do. We need to think about what we need to get out of the way and allow Christ to do in our lives. That's the way to think of it. Focus on Christ. Don't focus on self. Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. And focus on how we, how we can bring glory and honor to him. Let him have his way in us. Amen. Because it's glorious. That's what we're called for. Therefore, brethren, verse 10, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. In other words, we're not going to enter in without what? Moral excellence, true knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. We're not entering in unless these qualities are there. 
that's what the, you know, they're not, the, the citizens of the kingdom are going to have those qualities. Therefore, I'll always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. Verse 13, I consider it right as long as, as I am in this earthly dwelling. And, you know, when we think of that, now, Peter, we need not think of Peter, Peter was sending this letter to, because the letter is sent to us now. Amen. We're hearing a letter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit today. So today is for us and it's for those who are, who are watching, and it'll be those who maybe watch a sermon or find it on YouTube or at our website, uh, you know, for years to come, that will click on the sermon called <laughs> Sanctification. At that moment, it's for you, and it's from an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he says, the apostle says, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. So he did it while he was alive, but his words live on now that he's dead. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, Peter knew, he already knew he would be crucified, and he knew it was close. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. And that's what we're doing right now. We're calling these things that he told us before he was crucified. According to history, upside down, but I don't know if that's true. Seemed like that might be easier. So I don't know. So turn over to 1 Peter. Notice verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. He's writing to those who are chosen. Notice, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In other words, he chose those he foreknew. And what for? By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. What To do what? To obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. And sprinkled with his blood is justification. May peace, may, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. That's the value of grace and that's the value of peace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and is undefiled and will not fade away. And it is reserved for you in heaven. You who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. You know, Jesus said, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what he said we should rejoice in. In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Uh, this is a time, you know, when Nero was burning Christians to illuminate his garden. It was a terrible persecution. They had gone through the, the Jewish persecution, and now they're going through persecution of the Roman Empire as well. So they're being persecuted by both. So he's saying, rejoice. The Bible says rejoice always. Give thanks always. I had a cancerous tumor. Rejoice. I thank you, Lord. You have blessed me. You, my, my cup has it, 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 just ran over. You have given me wonderful children. You've given me wonderful church family. You've always been there for me. I, my life could not have been better 
And through all the difficult times, and there's been many, I, I value every one of them. Every single one of them. Doesn't matter whether I made mistakes or not. God knew I made mistakes before I ever made them. He knew I was going to make them. So it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even if you cause the problem, your own problem, as long as you allow God to bring good out of it. Amen? And that's what I, God has always done. And I appreciate that. Rejoice always. What can, what can man take? Man can't destroy your soul. The devil can't destroy your soul. Now you can let him corrupt your soul. You can, you can leave God. And, and, and then God will destroy your soul. You know, Jesus said, fear him who can destroy both soul and body. Don't, destroy, don't, don't fear the person who can just destroy your flesh. So, we were born again, verse 3, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Notice the apostles continually put the focus on who we are in Christ, our divine nature, what our goal is to glorify God to an eternal inheritance. To, to attain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away and it is reserved for you in heaven, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to re, be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise. What are these trials supposed to result in? Praise, praise and rejoicing. They are to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and look, no one's crucified me yet. No one has put anybody I know uh, has, has, you know, engulfed them in wax and burned them as a candle. That's part of the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, brother. That's a part of our precious body of Christ. I don't know anyone living in caves because of persecution, because they're, they're pursuing Christ. You know, Paul told the, the Hebrews, or the writer of Hebrews told the Hebrews, if we, you know, if, if you don't think Paul wrote it, but he told them, yes, you're being persecuted by your countrymen, but you haven't shed blood yet. There's a lot of people that shed blood. I mean, a lot of it, I think of Nathaniel, who was skinned alive. The blessed apostle. Skinned alive. I can't imagine that. But God allowed that to happen for his glory. For his glory. And Nathaniel had to have the mindset and the, and the, the spiritual strength to understand that, that he could endure all things. He could endure and do anything through Christ who strengthens him. And that's why it's so precious to me when Peter's wife was being crucified and Peter from a distance cried out, remember Christ, remember Christ. As she was suffering. What is it to be in Christ, brother? It's not what we see out here in churchianity. We had a good time at church today. Well, that's good. But there's going to be a time when you're hunted down like dogs. There's going to be a time when the, the, the trees are going to run with the blood of the saints. There's going to be a time when the, 
the blood from the altar and heaven cries out from the blood of the saints crying to God, how long? And Jesus will answer until the rest of the saints, your brethren, until they're killed. That's reality. Why can't we really appreciate this time, this time of open door? We should be so thankful and grateful. There's so many people right now that they don't have freedom. They don't have freedom. They, they can't share. If they share their faith, they could be imprisoned and even killed. But they do it anyway. Amen. See? For the cause of Christ. Because they don't belong to themselves. Amen? Amen. So he says, even if you are distressed by various trials, verse 6, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now but believe in him, you greatly rejoice, notice, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. In our right mind, the Holy Spirit filling us, Christ functioning properly, in us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's how we feel. Even in those times. Greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As for this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating that he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which, you have now, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So that's our calling. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. That's the only Jesus that the world is going to see. And that's, he's called us to represent him, to be an ambassador of him, amen? Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Verse 17, if you address the Father as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time and your stay on the earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. But with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. See, God did not call us and didn't save us so that we could just pursue whatever we wanted, but that we would pursue his glory and our inheritance is yet to come. Amen? Verse 20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Galatians chapter 5. Now you know, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, 
And the life I live is not my life, but it's Christ living his life in me. And in chapter 5, we're going to read about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is what sanctification produces in us. The sanctifying work of the Spirit will be in verse 13, chapter 5, Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see how different that is from the world? The world is, I'm getting mine, I'm going to get mine, you see. But God's way is, is I gave you mine, that you give what I gave you to someone else. You serve them as I served you. You have this attitude that was in me in you. So you were called to freedom, verse 13, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into the opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I mean, if we keep our focus on Christ and glorifying God, we won't be thinking about what we want for self. We'll be thinking what we can do to glorify and give to God. And then we trust God to bless us. Amen. We, we can't get for ourselves what God can give us. Amen. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. There's always war. There's an internal war, you know, when, there, there's, you know, when the spirit is not ruling. You know, because the flesh is set in its desire, and then there's a war that goes on in between. And as, as a, the uh, young brave asked the, the uh, chief, Indian chief that time, and that mentioned in a sermon, said there's two dogs in every man, a good one and a bad one. They're fighting <laughs> for control. Of course, it doesn't have to be that way with us. Because one dog's supposed to be already dead. Amen. We, don't, we need to quit resuscitating that dog. <laughs> Just let the dog lay dead. Amen. Let dead dogs lie. Let's put it that way instead of sleeping dogs. But he said, well, who's going to win? And the chief said, whichever one you feed, whichever dog you feed is going to be the stronger one. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. In other words, you, you don't do what you really know you should. That's what Paul was saying in Romans 7. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And here's the deeds of the flesh, and we know them. We all experience them in our own lives. Immorality impurity, impurity of anything, impurity of thoughts, impurity of thoughts toward others. Um, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let us not become, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So let's read that again. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. And that's what you have to do. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, when you think about crucifixion, that's, that's gruesome. I mean, that's, that's pretty gruesome. That's the most gruesome death you can think of. I mean, nailing someone to a cross, beating them and then nailing them to a cross. But that's what he says we have to do to the, the flesh and the passions and the desires to nail it to the cross. They're already there. Jesus already bore them. We just have to let him have them. Amen. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now as a result of the sanctification process, God's work, spiritual work, we bear those fruits of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, you know, we look at the fruits we bear. Jesus said, listen, you will know by the fruits they bear, whether good or bad. Uh, a tree is known by the fruits that are born. You know if something is good by the fruit that is born. I mean, isn't that right? I mean, I just had some allergy testing and they tested me for different allergens. I'm allergic to dog dander. I'm allergic to dust mites and grass. You know, they have help. You know why? Because my body reacted in an adverse way when I was, I was exposed to those things, you see. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it, it is with us as well. We, you know, we... There's some things that produce bad fruits. We don't want to put ourselves in harm's way, amen? Because Jesus said, you will know the tree. You will know them by their fruits, whether good or whether evil. Now, of those fruits that we were reading about there in Galatians chapter 5, um, I just want to take three of them and just briefly talk about three of them. And that's love, joy, and peace. Because those are the things that I think the world certainly does not, have, has never really truly known. Now, people have known some happiness, but there's, their, their state of being is subjected to outside um, circumstances. And most people cannot be happy unless they are in a happy situation or happy circumstances, you see. And most people can't rejoice. I mean, if you, get, if you get a call and say you won the lottery, there'd be some rejoicing. If the Cowboys win, you know, Sunday, there'll be some rejoicing in some houses around here. And, um, you know, there's some rejoicing, uh, but that's not real rejoicing. Real rejoicing is an inner deep um, you know, joy that you have in the Lord regardless of that. But we're going to look at love first. First Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I know all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, and I have all faith, as even to, to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous Love does not brag, and love is not arrogant. Love does not act in an unbecoming way. It does not seek its own interest. It is not provoked, and it does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now, the world does not know a love like this. The, dove, the world doesn't know a love that does not take into account a wrong suffered. 
Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. But now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we're not grieving the Holy Spirit, we're not quenching the Holy Spirit, it will produce that kind of love in us. That's sanctification. And when people see the love of Christ in us, the true love of Christ in us, where we're truly truly willing to be wronged, to suffer wrong, we're truly willing to turn the other cheek, even when we know that whoever it is that is, is, is persecuting us is wrong, when we're willing to do that, As Peter says, it pleases God when we bear up when we're unjustly treated. It pleases him. Why not just bear it? Christ bore it. And when we bear it, then we are living out the life of Christ here on this earth. And people see Christ. You know, there was a... uh, I think it was, it may have been Ravi Zacharias that I heard tell a story about a a Muslim. He was an Eastern man and had formerly been uh, a Muslim. And he's a Christian now. But he was uh, a professor at a university. uh, And he uh, actually... There was a, he had a debate, I think, with a Muslim uh, cleric and uh, who was very radical and very hateful and called Christianity an effeminate religion. And most of the audience were students who were Muslim and they were on the side of the cleric. But he was so harsh and so hateful in some of his comments. At the end of the debate, the, the Christian um, professor said, why do you speak so hatefully toward my religion? And he says, because your religion is effeminate. Your religion is disgusting. And uh, he said, come, come up here. So he came up there. And he reared back and he slapped him on the cheek as hard as he could. I mean, just slapped him hard. And he said, now, turn the other cheek. He did. He did turn the other cheek. But the cleric didn't want to hit him again because he saw that the the students were shocked that he struck that. Professor, on the cheek. So he says, your, your, your effeminate, weak Christian religion tells you you've got to give me your coat, give me your coat. And he took it and he gave it. He also says, you have to give me your shirt. He took, give, me a, give me your shirt, give me your pants. And he stood there in his underwear, this professor. And you know, he was willing to suffer shame for Christ. That's love. And the Muslim cleric stormed out. And he said, 
you would not believe the line of students that came to his door that were affected by what had happened and who, who apologized and told him how they admired him. And the Muslim cleric was simply trying to make him look weak and his religion look weak. But they could see through it all that it wasn't weak being on the cross. It wasn't weak uh, giving yourself up to be beaten. It wasn't weak to turn the other cheek. And it wasn't weak to give your coat to someone. It wasn't weak to be taken advantage of for the cause of Christ. It was far stronger. And they could see the difference. They saw Christ that day. They saw Jesus in that professor. So it didn't matter what went on in all the, the, the debate, whether the Muslim cleric had made his points to almost an entire Muslim audience. In the end, the Christian professor allowed himself to be struck hard across the face and disrobed and embarrassed and shamed in front of all was standing victorious in Christ Jesus. That's love. That's being willing. Again, love bears all things. Love rejoices in the truth. Love does not act in an unbecoming way. Love does not seek its own interest. Love is not provoked. He was not provoked. The man just slapped his face off and then said, turn the other cheek, and he did. Instead of slapping him again, he said, he saw. He saw that the, the students were, were, were taken back by him just receiving that slap and turning the other cheek. So he says, no, your, your religion says you got to give me your coat, your, your, your shirt, give me your pants too. And he stood there, just robed. And that day they saw Jesus and they saw the love of Christ. Love is patient, it's kind, it's not jealous. Doesn't act unbecoming. Does not seek its own interests. It's not even thinking about self. What I want for me. What does somebody do to me? People should be thinking, what do you do to somebody? What do you do? What did you do that God had to send his own son to die for you? Who are you to point the finger at somebody else? Well, we're not anyone to point the finger at anyone else. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love never fails. That's love. And that can only come through the Holy Spirit. And that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that love must be, must be operating in us. Now listen, I understand. I'm standing here too. I read these things and I know me just like you know you. And I'm not foolish or deceived enough to think that I even remotely, you know, see this operating in its fullness in me. I recognize that. But I also recognize that that's God's will. That that's why he gave the Holy Spirit to me. I do know that that must be my goal because that's his goal. I do know that I must be diligent to ensure that God, through Christ, can produce that kind of love in me and not actively quench it. You know, even though I will be like Paul, I will fail sometimes. But you get up, you continue on, and keep your eyes fixed on glorifying Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, joy. I just want to read a few things that that I looked up about joy. We find, like Peter said, in Christ we have inexpressible joy. Joy, the state of being joy, and that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And others should see that love in us like they did that professor who was willing to be 
uh, just shamed and embarrassed in front of his students and all the student body. And that was love working. And joy. The Holy Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. You know, what we read Paul said, that the fruits of the Spirit are these. When you know that God is living in you and the Spirit is working unchallenged, ungrieved, unquenched, we will have love, we will have patience, we'll have joy, we'll have peace. We have self-control, long-suffering, temperance. But we'll have joy. Joy is great delight. Just to be absolutely delighted. It is to have a very glad heart. Glad, regardless of what the circumstances are. You see, listen, the Holy Spirit is glad no matter what's going on around us. The Holy Spirit looks beyond temporary trials. The Holy Spirit looks to the purpose of it all, the proving of our faith, which is precious, more precious than gold. Joy is a happy state of mind coming from knowing and yielding to the sanctification through the Spirit. That's what it is, is to have a happy state of mind. Now, I know we're not just happy all the time. Because we let things in the world get in the way. But if we resist the flesh and the pulls of the world and we allow focus on Christ, we can't help but be happy. We just can't help but be happy. And you just can't. Joy is a deep abiding. And there's a deep inner rejoicing inside that is always there. It's like a, a light burning we're happy, we're joyful, we're cheerful, we're even festive sometimes. You know, uh, when, you know, we discovered the tumor this last time in my colon and I was blocked, you know, Trion began to react like she did five years ago. But things are a lot different five years ago. I'm not the same as I was five years ago, neither is she and neither is the church. I don't worry about the church like I did five years ago. See? And, but she came up and I saw that look in her face. And I said, honey, it's a small matter. It's a small matter. It's appointed to everyone to die if I die, I die. I mean, you're going to die sometime. The day of your death is better than the day of your birth. So what is the big deal? I mean, you know, if you've got unfinished business, that's one thing. If you feel like, oh, man, I'm going to worry about her. I'm going to worry about my children. I'm going to worry about the church. But, you know, I don't. I have faith in y'all. I have faith in, in you know, you, you guys being your brothers and sisters keepers. And I know God provides. You see, he's already provided. And, you know, continue to provide. And with that, I could have a joy and I could have a contentment and I could have a peace. Now, speaking of peace, I've, I've just got a few things here that I didn't have room to put on my, my paper, so I just have it here um, from my topped it out. But you know, Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection, he appeared to them three times and each time he said something very significant. He said, peace, I leave with you. Peace is so important. We must have peace because where there is no peace, there's war. Where there's no peace in the world, there's war. Where there's no peace in our mind, there's war. Uh, you know, that there, when there's no peace, um, you know, in our heart, there's war. And war is bad and destructive whether it's on the earth, whether it's in us, among family, uh, in a church, you know, uh, in our own mind, in relationships or whatever. So he said, peace, I leave with you. You know, he could have said a lot of things, but he said, peace, I leave with you. That's the value of peace. And without peace, success is absolutely impossible. I mean, 
Peace is the result of success. Amen? It is a fruit of success. The spirit, in us, it's the fruit of the Spirit successfully functioning properly in us, you see, the sanctifying work. Here's what I found as far as just what defines peace. And it says, the presence and experience of right relationships, the tranquility of the soul, a sense of well-being and fulfillment that comes from God and is dependent on his presence. I want to say something. When all the trouble was happening with Worldwide and they were going back to the world and, and you, so many of thousands of us were just very disturbed and I just sat for hours every day and studied. I had to go back now and reprove things. Was I wrong? Were what is it, or is what they're saying now, they had it wrong back then and now they've got it right. Is, are they right now? Are they wrong now and we're wrong, you know, or, and right back then or what? So I had to do that and I diligently did that. And God filled me with the Holy Spirit in a way that was just absolutely extremely powerful. I mean, I could not even, uh, in contact with any other church brethren, there was a palatable, palatable presence there and they knew no one would even challenge anything that I would say because it was God at the time. I mean, God was just speaking through the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, I'd never experienced that before. And I remember being... See, I was pursuing, I was absolutely positive and that I was pursuing the truth and what was right. I was pursuing God's will. God, what is your will? I wasn't trying to prove them wrong and me right. I was going, I'm saying, what is wrong and what is right? They're saying we used to have it right and now we've changed it on many subjects. So now I've got to go back and I've got to reprove all these things because at that time it had been 18 years. See? And I've just taken them for granted. That's what happens. So I had to reprove them. And when I spent all that time being diligent, seeking the will of God, seeking the truth, regardless. I mean, in my mind, I thought, how can I, how can I take my family out? This is all my family has ever known. How, where would I go? What would I do? There's nowhere else to go. I mean, it was awful. The very thought of leaving the church, I didn't know how that was even possible. But I also knew I couldn't follow them into heresy. I couldn't go back to the world. I couldn't go back to Christmas and Easter and Sunday and things that, so I had to go back and reprove those things. And I found out they were long, wrong on a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. But in the areas, many of the areas where they disagreed with mainstream Christianity, they were still right on. But I want you to know that I noticed something at that time that I had a peace that I never experienced. I had a tranquility when I would go to bed. I'd had an absolute tranquility and a peace all the time. There was not one doubt, not one question who I was and who I was in Christ. And it was because I was just simply doing what I should have always done. <laughs> <laughs> you see and it's not easy to maintain I didn't maintain it but I know it's possible to have a perfect tranquil peace and be filled completely with God and only about God and not neglect your responsibilities too 
because that happened to me. And I did not know that was possible. But when I went back and I called upon God, he filled me so much with the Holy Spirit that all those fruits were just there. And I tell you, it was, it was almost embarrassing because it seemed like everything came out of my mouth was profound, you know. Sometimes people would come later and say, what'd you say? And I said, I don't even know. I can't even remember. Because it wasn't me, you know. It was just God at the time. So notice, according to this dictionary, Bible dictionary, uh, peace is the presence and experience of right relationships, peace and relationships, the tranquility of soul. That's so precious to be at peace no matter. You know, when, I mean, I slept fine when I, you know, when I had a tumor for the second time, knowing that it would be worse, passing blood, couldn't eat, couldn't have a bowel movement. God healed me. And I'm glad he did. But my next waking moment would be in glory. A sense of well-being, that's what I had. And fulfillment that comes from God and is dependent upon his presence. It's an inner tranquility and poise of the saint, of Christians, whose trust is in God through Christ. And it says tranquility, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation, and the absence of discord. That's what peace is. It's not only what it is, but it's what it's the absence of. And, and this one says, without the peace of God op operating in your life, you become easily rattled, shaken, tormented, knocked right off your game in the Lord by any adversity that comes along your way. But we need not... We need not. We need to go on and allow the sanctification process to work. Walking in and fulfilling our purpose that we were set up for. The state of properly functioning. And we'll end, conclude with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And then we'll have... Michael, come up and close us in prayer. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. And there's things to do in encumbrance. I've had to lay things aside. You know, I mean, I had, you know, a family that I was very close to. I mean, very close to. Traveled all over the country with. And, uh, you know, that were involved in, in the birth of my three of my children. Um, but there were just bad fruits there. Bad fruits there. And, you know, I tried to fix it. And, it you know, we became friends and close. When I was young, church member, you know, this guy was raised in the church, kind of took me under his wing. But... Uh, there was always problems. He, he always had problems with, you know, he had envy problems with other people in the church. He, 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 he had a position in the church, but he always wanted more. He was always imputing, imputing motives to others. And it came a time, and I got caught up in it. And it came a time to where I just, you know, when, when the, these things started changing and I began to go back and started studying, I became, I became more like, well, wait a minute. I was, I was just operating in the flesh. And it began to just, no, it was noticeably different the more I began to study and the, the changes that were happening in the church. And I began to go back to the, to the Bible and the Holy Spirit began to cleanse me and sanctify me and setting me farther apart. I was way apart from where they were, you know. And it was extremely difficult to do. But I just had to go. And it didn't go over well, believe me. To this day, I had to go and I'm saying, I'm not going to, we're not going to be close anymore. I'm not going to, we're not spending time together anymore, you know, because, you know, they rubbed off on me. 
And I wasn't rubbing off enough on them after I was right, you know. And, uh, I mean, I, I did my part. I talked to him a lot. You know, when he would come to me and say, you know, complain about someone or saying somebody's doing this and they're doing that and they want, they want in charge, they want to take this and take that from me or whatever. He was always, you know, that's the way he was. And that's the way the church was. That's the way worldwide was, you know. A power struggle, you know, type thing. I mean, I'm serious. Someone's in charge of picking up the chairs. And if you pick them up, somebody come to you and say, who told you to do that? I'm serious. Now, this is the way it was. You might say, well, I was just trying to help out. They said, well, you don't have the authority to help out unless somebody told you to. You know, that's the way they were. I mean, you, 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 you usurp in a store, you're trying to take my job. That's, that's the way they were. And uh, I remember even after I left the church, the wife called me. She was frantic. I didn't even like her anymore. She didn't like me. She was actually acting, my enemy. And she called me. Wanted to talk to me. I said, what do you want to talk to me about? Well, so-and-so is going to be ordained an elder. I said, so? Well, you know he shouldn't be an elder. I said, I'm not even in the church anymore over there. <laughs> you know, I don't care what they do. You know, your husband shouldn't be what he is either. <laughs> I didn't say that, but that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, <laughs> But, you know, the reason I bring this up, that was an encumbrance. Now, they didn't have to be an encumbrance. They weren't an encumbrance until I got right. When I got right, I saw it was an encumbrance. So I tried to help them not be an encumbrance, but they didn't receive it. They didn't want it. They wanted to pursue the things they wanted. So they brought accusations against me to those higher up, you know, Fortunately, they didn't believe them, but that's how it came about. That's how it is, all worldly. So he says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. I've had to lay aside encumbrances like video games. But when we first got a computer, there's a little video games like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I found out I spent too much time on it, so I laid it down. And then when I got my Kindle the first time, there's baseball. Everybody knows I love baseball. And I played it. But it's okay to play. I'm not saying it's wrong. But I'm saying I'd spent too much time. So you know what I did? I just laid it down. Because I found out I couldn't. I wasn't very good at, at, at uh, you know, doing it in moderation. So I laid it aside. So lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We can't run, you know, as long as we... But I tell you, you don't need to run if you're looking back. <laughs> hey, I remember one time I, was at a, I went to see the Bulls play when Michael Jordan played. And we were outside and there was some woman, a bunch of people walking, you know, but there was some guy that was looking at a girl. You know, he, he was in front of me, and I saw him looking over at this girl. He walked straight into a pole, a steel <laughs> pole. His face hit that pole because his eyes weren't on where he was walking. And he kept on walking. He hit it hard. <laughs> I felt so sorry for that guy. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I didn't feel sorry for him. Let us run the race with endurance. That is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Think about him, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hallelujah. 